Father in heaven, Lord, we pray that you will be with us this afternoon as we go through this relatively short presentation, but with some important points. Lord, please be with me as I speak. Lord, please may your presence just be here and speak to each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this first afternoon's presentation, uh, I've entitled The Bible and Peer-Reviewed Science. And you can see that the verse that is highlighted there is Psalms 119, uh, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I would like to begin with a story. I was taking some of my nephews, my nephews uh, uh, exploring, taking care of them. Um, their, their mother has been away and, uh, and their dad uh, because of a health emergency. And so we were taking care of the kids. And um, you know, one of the things that you're doing if you're taking care of kids is finding something constructive for them to do. Uh, that's, that's edifying, that gets energy out. They're nine, seven, and six. And so there's a lot of energy. In fact, you can run them from, from the morning until the evening, and yet still they are energetic. It's really a remarkable thing, the way that God made children. And uh, so one of the things that we did is we hunted petrified wood a lot. We went out into the creeks and we hunted and we explored, you know, and so I've got nine, seven, and six. You know, my, the little six-year-old niece, you know, she's yay high. But, she, boy, she was tough. You know, we had her wading through the, the creeks and, you know, jumping off the sand dunes and exploring. And, you know, we had a great time. Anyways, one day we found our way up this creek. And uh, they were swinging on these vines that were in the, in the forest. And they made a fire on the beach. And they were having a wonderful time. And the dog was in the creek. And we just had a wonderful afternoon. But you know how it is when you're in the outdoors. Nighttime comes. And night starts to fall. And uh, we had never been up this far up this creek. And it starts to get a little bit cooler. This was, you know, maybe a month and a half or two ago. It starts to get a little bit cooler. And uh, there's the owls are starting to make noises in the trees. And, um, and my seven-year-old nephew had looked at me a couple of times already, and he had said, you know, we should go back. I said, don't worry, we're going to go back. You know, your brother's enjoying the fire. Yeah, yeah, but we should go back. Oh, don't worry, we will. No, Uncle Jay, we should go back. Are you worried? I said. Yes, I am worried. Why are you worried? Because you've never been here before. And, and it's getting dark, and... Uh, there's stuff in the woods, and we're a long ways from home. And I said, do you think that I'm going to bring you out to the creek? And I'm going to get us all lost. I know the way home. And, uh, and he looked at me, and he started crying. And he said, Uncle Jay, you don't know the way home. He said, he said um, you've never been here before. And I said, I know the way home. You have to trust me. And, and so as we went back, we had a couple more discussions sort of like this. And I, I looked at him at one point right in the eyes. And I said, look, you have to trust me. We're going to get home. In fact, I'm telling you right now, we will be back before it is dark. And, and he looked at me and he said, OK. And the tears stopped. And the tears stopped because he trusted what I said. Before that, he didn't trust what I said. And this world is a mess. And none of us gets out of this alive without Jesus. And there is only one way home. And you have got to trust your compass. You have got to trust your compass. The word is trustworthy. It is your compass. And I'll tell you something else. Jesus has been here before. He has been here before. He knows the way back. He knows how to take each one of us home. He knows how to get us there. You have to trust him. The thing that he has given you to trust is his word. Now, in this earth, which is full of lies, it is not just popular, it is normal now to reject the Bible. It is normal to reject the Bible. And 
I'm going to run a short video here on the question of authority as we look at the Bible or peer-reviewed science. If I say peer-reviewed science, you all know what I'm talking about, right? Peer-reviewed science is what? That is the gold standard of information now, right? If peer-reviewed science says it, that means it's true. So what is peer-reviewed science? It means somebody makes a proposal, they have a theory, and then it is reviewed by their peers. That's other people just like us. A lot of times who are just as lost as us or more lost. So I don't want to step on any toes with this presentation, and if I do, it'll be gentle. So let's just watch this uh, video clip. Oh, wait a second here. Um, is there a video on that slide? Oh, OK. Um, it may have been erased or so. We can come back to it. Um, OK, so you see what this is here. 20,679 physicians say luckies are less irritating. It's toasted. OK, so these were commonplace back in the day. And this company, what they would do is they would go to physicians, and they would pay the p physicians to endorse their product. OK, so this is a, a peer-reviewed process, if you will. So you know that's a lot of physicians. And they all say that these kinds of cigarettes are less irritating, therefore you should smoke these kinds of cigarettes. Um, here's another advertisement from the same time period approximately. Don't smoke is hard advice for patients to swallow. May we suggest instead you smoke Philip Morris. Three out of four cases of smokers cough cleared on changing to Philip Morris. So they've done a study. So when you switch from one brand of cigarettes to another brand of cigarettes, your smoker's cough clears up in three out of four cases. And this is presented to the public as an authority. And the world is full of this kind of stuff. Um, I think there actually is a slide here. Uh, is it possible to hover over it and then hit play? I don't know, for whatever reason, it's not playing. Um, we can come back to them. Uh, and I know there's one here as well, but how to make it play, I'm not sure. Anyways, uh, we'll work on that. Peer-reviewed science says the following. Okay, now this is peer-reviewed science. Peer-reviewed science says there is no God. Peer-reviewed science says there's no meaning or purpose to life. Peer-reviewed science, in fact, most of the scientists on the world are together on this, that you descended from lobsters and monkeys. This is the peer-reviewed science. The dinosaurs became birds. That is consensus. That is scientific consensus. Males can become females, and females can become males, and there's all sorts of genders in between. And the best way to treat someone who thinks they were born into the wrong body is to give them cross-sex hormones and to cut their genitals off. That is all peer-reviewed science. And it all clashes with the Word of God. At the beginning, you have the question of authority. God has said one thing. This actually is very simple. You boil this down to its lowest common denominator. You boil this down to one thing. And it's the question of authority. Who can you trust? Can you trust the Word of God? Can you trust it? Because your life depends on who you trust. Your salvation depends on who you trust. And the serpent says to Eve in the garden, has God said? And this is his way of introducing the subject so that he can qualify what God said and he can dismiss it and introduce something else. And this is always how Satan works. He set himself up as the authority on the benefits of the forbidden fruit. And he dazzled people. And then we are where we are today. The fact of the matter is, is that despite the fact that peer-reviewed science and organizations, governmental organizations, approves pharmaceuticals, they kill people in large numbers. Pharmaceuticals, prescription pharmaceuticals, are the third leading cause of death in the United States. And these are not drugs that are street drugs. We're not talking about illegal drugs. 
We're not talking about things like fentanyl. We're talking about prescription medication. And so you have somebody in a white lab coat who is an authority, and he tells you to take this. And gradually, humanity has come around to the point where this is what they believe. Is it true? It's true. So I, and I'm not try, I don't want to offend anybody. That's not the point of this. But the point of this is, is that it's your body, and you have to take your own health into your own hands. Just because somebody in a white lab coat says, take this, doesn't mean that you should. Now, in the interest of time and things like that, I, I cut most of these slides out. But this is the facts. Common side effects of pharmaceuticals. These are just a random list of pharmaceutical side effects. These are the drugs that are approved by the FDA and which are taken by the millions and the tens of millions by Americans every single day. The side effects of these drugs are extreme fear, hallucinations, fainting, coma, fussiness, irritability, crying for an hour or longer, paralysis, thoracic hematoma, that's bleeding into your chest, a clot in your lungs, decrease in your testicle size, that's only for men, or at least it used to be only for men, sores or swelling in your rectal or genital area, blue lips or fingernails, white patches or sores inside your mouth or on your lips, Irregular back and forth movements of your eyes, a lump in your breast, decreased bone marrow function, congestive heart failure, coma, breathing stopping, and erectile dysfunction. This is just a small list of the known side effects of these drugs. And they are all given to you by peer reviewed research. Now, God's servant says, God's servants should not administer medicines which they know will leave behind injurious effects upon the system, even if they do relieve present suffering. Every poisonous preparation in the vegetable and mineral kingdoms taken into the system will leave its wretched influence affecting the liver and lungs and deranging the system generally. So you see the quote up there. Why sanitariums were established. This is just three quotes. Okay, from, from the pen of inspiration. Nothing should be put into the human system that will leave a baleful influence behind. And to carry out light, the light on this subject to practice hygienic treatment is the reason which has been given to me for establishing sanitariums in various localities. That one's from Medical Missionary. Years ago, the Lord revealed to me that institutions should be established for treating the sick without drugs. Man is God's property. And the ruin that has been made of the living habitation, the suffering caused by the seeds of death sown in the human system, are an offense to God. Okay, so this, I, this is very straight talk from the pen of inspiration. Does God care about humanity? Yes, he bought humanity. He became human to rescue us. We talked this morning about he went to the cross. He purchased humanity. So does he care about what is happening to humanity? You've got a third, uh, the third leading cause of death in this country is taking pills prescribed by doctors. Does Jesus care about that? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Now, I would just like to point out that this idea of peer reviewing truth has been around for a long time. Open your Bibles with me to Numbers chapter 1. Uh, verses 1 to 12. This matters to us materially. Numbers 14, verses 1 to 12. Are we coming back to the border of the promised land? Yes, we are. Did you know that the process of peer review cost Israel entrance into the promised land the first time? What does that mean? It means they went with the consensus. Let's read it together. So they come to the border of the promised land. Caleb and Joshua have come back with the other ten spies. The other ten spies have this terrible report. Caleb and Joshua have a good report. And it says here, verse 1, All the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. So you have millions and millions of people, several million people, weeping. And then they started complaining. Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in the wilderness? Why has the Lord brought us 
unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? And they said one to another. This is the peer review process. We want to go back. We're not going forward. We're not going forward. They said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return unto Egypt. Now, friends, I want to tell you, since we are coming back to the border of the promised land, since we know that this is the case, we each have to have a, make an individual decision. Do we trust the Word of God? Do we trust it over what other people are saying? Do we trust it over what so-called peer-reviewed science says? And I'm not talking about obvious issues. I'm talking about the things that are commonplace in our world. Peer-reviewed science says that we all evolved from lobsters. That's the consensus. You know, where are we on that? Peer-reviewed science. Are we going to peer-review the, uh, peer the atonement? Joshua and Caleb rent their clothes. They tore their clothes and they said, this is a good land. Verse 10, but all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Is this a warning about going with consensus? Do not follow a multitude to do evil, the scripture says. And thankfully, the second time that they came back to the promised land, to the border of the promised land, the majority of them were ready to go in. Could it be said the same today for us? The process of peer review caused people to miss the Messiah. Did you know that? John 7 verse 48 says, Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? And so they, these people were saying, Look, you're saying this is the Messiah. Sure, he's doing miracles. But which one of the priests and the rabbis believe that this is the Messiah? And they took the consensus out of their peers and they made that their doctrine. It made that, they made that their theology. And this is ancient Israel. This is ancient Israel who had the prophecies. This is ancient Israel who had everything that they needed to recognize the Messiah. And yet instead of looking at the evidence right there in front of them and searching the scriptures, they said... Who else is going to believe in this guy? And if nobody else believes in him, I'm not either. You know, the shaking is coming. The shaking is coming to this church. Everything is being shaken. The people that you sit next to in the pew, I hope to God that they are ready for what is coming. And I hope that everybody goes along and follows the Lord. But what if they don't? You have a decision to make. Who are you going to follow? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? Or peer reviews? Science, so-called. The other people. There was no peer-reviewed science on looking at the serpent of brass. Do you know that? There was no medical research on it. There was no academic journals on it. The serpents come into the camp. Moses is told to make a serpent of brass. Everybody who says... What academic journal says there's a study on looking at the serpent of brass to cure a snake bite? All those people died because they didn't trust the Word of God. And what I want to tell you this morning is, is that the Bible and society are decoupling. Okay, they are decoupling. They're, you know, the, the Lord is on the highway to heaven and, and, uh, and society took the exit ramp. Somewhere back there where... You know, they decided that some men have a uterus. Okay? Where are we? Are we still on the highway? You know, will there be other exit ramps? Yes, there will. What does the Bible say? That is where your compass is. You want to get home? Jesus is home. You know, uh, we live in a crazy world. The woman with the issue of blood. How many peer-reviewed journals had she read? How many physicians had she been to? Twelve years she had this issue. She spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. Is it possible that she is a symbol of this church? We're going to try everything else until we try this God's way. 
We have the pen of inspiration. We have the counsels regarding how to get to the heavenly city. We're going to try everything else until the situation is so extremely devastatingly difficult that finally we'll try to touch the hem of the master physician. You know, praise the Lord, that's what she did at the end. But think of her suffering along the way to get to that point. She suffered and suffered and suffered. You know, five years, if you're a kid in this, in this congregation, you're thinking to yourself, five years is an eternity. Some of you are probably less than 10 years old. I remember when a summer was an eternity. A day waiting for my friends to come back to school was an eternity. This woman was sick 12 years. And what she trusted in was peer-reviewed science. Not that there's anything wrong with science that supports the Bible. We want science that supports the Bible. But when science departs from the Bible, it doesn't matter how many people say that it's true. You have to go with the Word of God. Could anyone show me the peer-reviewed science on the benefits of bathing in the Jordan River? Was there any studies on that? Naaman the Syrian comes from another country, and he's got leprosy. And some girl in his household who was a missionary in his household, she says to her mistress, she says, you know what? I wish that we were in Israel because the prophet would heal your husband. And so she tells her husband and he tells the king and all of a sudden there's this entourage going towards Israel, going towards Samaria. And all because of the word of this little girl. You know, just a word, one word spoken of in due season. We have this amazing story in the scriptures. She was faithful in her mission. Drop this little seed. All of a sudden you have scores of soldiers going to Samaria with their captain and he's a leper and he gets to, his, he gets to Israel and he goes to Elisha's house, 2 Kings 5, verse 11. And Elisha sends somebody to tell him, sends a servant. He leaves, you know, he leaves instructions for him. He doesn't even come out. This is the captain of the Syrian army. He's a very important man. He wants to be recovered of his leprosy. He wants to be healed. And Elisha doesn't even come out to meet with this man. Elisha tests his faith to the utmost. And Elisha says to him, through an agent, go down and bathe in the Jordan River seven times and your flesh will come again like a little baby. And when this man hears this, he's angry. He's upset. Do you know why? Because he wants a pill. He wants somebody to write him an official prescription for his leprosy. Somebody with authority to come out and say, well, this is the science on this subject. And he says, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpur rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? He's like, there's rivers in Syria. I don't need your stinking, muddy Jordan River. And he started to go away in a rage. He's like, I'm out of here. And when I get back to the king, I'm going to tell him he needs to make war on this whole country. That was what he wanted to do. And his servants said to him, they, they came near unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you, do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much rather when he says to you, wash and be clean? Does Jesus say to us today, wash and be clean? You know, we talked about the atonement and about the love of Jesus and how he has purchased humanity. What is our instructions? By faith believe, wash, and be clean. That's it. You don't have to go out and slay any dragons. You know, there's no crusades you need to take up place to be right with God. All you have to do is repent and believe and be baptized. You know, this is the instruction, wash and be clean. And Naaman, he's like, okay, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Can you please show me the peer-reviewed literature on raising the dead? Is there any peer-reviewed literature on that? When Jesus comes back to Lazarus' house, this is all about faith. You just imagine the situation. Lazarus is dead. He's been dead four days. And Jesus comes back, and 
he's met by the sisters and he says, they go to the tomb and he says to Martha, take away the stone. And she says, Lord, it's been four days, it's hot outside, he smells bad. My brother is dead, he smells bad. We can't move away the stone. Don't you know what the science on this says? After two or three days, the body starts to decompose. It smells bad. That's why we got a rock in front of the entrance. You know, he stinks. And she could have stopped to say, has anybody ever raised the dead before? Show me the academic journals. Show me the peer-reviewed journals on raising the dead, especially after four days. If she had not believed, her brother would not have been raised. Uh, every single one of these stories is a warning to us and an invitation to put our trust in the Word of God. Why am I speaking on this subject this morning? Because faith in this book in Christianity is at an all-time low. This is the only way home. That's it. There isn't another way. And your life depends on putting your faith in this book. Putting it in this book. 100%. First Corinthians says, but we, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Can you show me the peer-reviewed science on bringing a lamb as a sacrifice? Can you show me the peer-reviewed science on eating unleavened bread before the exodus? or eating with my sandals on, or putting door on blood on the door of the lintels. Every single thing that they went through was by faith. And we are called to exercise that faith. We are called to exercise that faith. Now this is a short talk this afternoon in preparation for a much longer talk starting, starting at 4 p.m. on the subject of last day events. But let us turn in conclusion to Hebrews chapter 11. Because I think that it is incumbent on us to remember the divergence in the world around us. You don't belong to this world. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, this world is not your home. And this world left the highway to heaven a long ways back. Amen. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. How is faith the substance of things hoped for? What is substantial about faith? That faith is in something that is unchangeable, that is never going away, and that is the Word of God. And it is more real than anything that you see on this earth. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. This is right at the beginning. This is where the divergence happens. Does the world believe this? No. Does peer-reviewed science believe this? No. Be very careful of people in white lab coats. They're going to tell you all sorts of things. And yet we know that this world is full of lies and that we are journeying to the heavenly city. How do we get there? It is by faith. The beginning of that faith is that God made this earth. That means he took care of it all this time. He is coming back. It's not like he left and he's not coming back. He's coming back. He's the person that, who made this earth. He's the person who's coming back to save us. He is the author and finisher of our faith. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. What did Cain bring? Cain brought his, old, his own works. Cain says to me, can you show me the peer-reviewed science on bringing a lamb? Why should I do that? I grew all these nice root vegetables and some broccoli and uh, squash and things like that. And, and he brings this as a sacrifice. He's like, I don't believe your method. And this is where it starts, right there. You have two lines. And the people who do not turn back are the people who put their trust and their faith 100% in this book. Now, I don't think we got those videos to run, did we? You found them? Um, I, let's, uh, let's just conclude with the first two. Let's play them in order if you just play the first one.
Is there sound? If you were to follow a busy doctor as he makes his daily round for many calls. men of medicine, you usually find yourself just having long a mighty busy enjoy a cigarette. Time keeping up with him. And because time they know what many men of medicine is, usually means mild, just long enough to enjoy a cigarette. cigarette. They're particular about the brand they choose. Maybe, you know, can we go back to the beginning and start again? If you're a smoker. <laughs> Cat's out of the bag. Okay, go on back. We'll just wait a moment for that. You know, if you were to follow a busy doctor as he makes his daily round of calls, you'd find yourself having a mighty busy time keeping up with him. Time out for many men of medicine usually means just long enough to enjoy a cigarette. And because they know what a pleasure it is to smoke a mild, good-tasting cigarette, they're particular about the brand they choose. In a repeated national survey, doctors in all branches of medicine Doctors in all parts of the country were asked, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Once again, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Why not change to Camels for the next 30 days and see what a difference it makes in your smoking enjoyment? See how Camels agree with your throat. See how mild and good tasting a cigarette can be. All right, let's roll the next video. If you're a smoker, I have a tip for you. Make a video of yourself before all this happens. Read a children's storybook or sing a lullaby. I wish I had. The only voice my grandson's ever heard is this one. How's that for a cigarette commercial? You can quit. For free help, visit cdc.gov slash tips. This world is full of lies. It is absolutely full of lies. At the beginning, there was one lie. You go out that door, Adam and Eve went out that door, and the whole world is full of lies. Coming back, you are coming back through a hail of lies. You're coming to one point, that door. Jesus is the way, the only way. The only way. And I just, I just want to exhort. I want to exhort you to put your faith implicitly in this book. This is our safeguard. The world is getting an off in, into is getting to be an awfully unstable and crazy place. You're going to see strange things. I saw a video where Vladimir Putin was taking calls in Russia, and it was uh, by video, some of them. And, and the next caller gets on the video, and who is it? It's Putin, asking Putin a question. And he steps back, he leans back in his chair, and he looks, and it's him. And it sounds just like him. We're going to see strange things, friends. You're not going to be able to trust your eyes. It's dark and it's foggy, and what you have in your hands is this. Is this where you put your trust? Don't let anybody make fun of you for trusting in the Word of God. They took the exit ramp. We need to pray that they get back on. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for your word, for the fact that it never fails, that you've given us a clear compass in the world that we live in, in the fog that we live in. Lord, may we supplant in our own mind's eye the authority of men and put in its place your word and your promises. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you very much. That was a short presentation, relatively short presentation. The next presentation, which will begin at 4 o'clock, is on last day events. 
it's going to be well over an hour. Probably it'll be more like an hour and 40 minutes. So um, what we could do is you could take a stretch uh, for 10 or 15 minutes, and we could come back here and we could start again. Um, with the, is that a good plan, or do you want to wait till 4? Okay, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's take a 15-minute break, and uh, we'll come back here at, uh, at 10, 10 after. Let's make it 20 minutes.